You're listening to The South Stands, a Buckeye football podcast by Ohio State fans for Ohio State fans on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Welcome back to The South Stands, a Buckeye football podcast by Ohio State fans for Ohio State fans from the West Coast. I'm your host, Zach Moore. Today is Sunday, November 20th. And I'm here today to recap number two, Ohio State's 43-30 win over the Maryland Terrapins in College Park yesterday afternoon. It was a survive and advance Saturday for all of college football's contenders yesterday. Well, for all those that played real games. We won't mention the SEC teams that scheduled cupcakes. But you had number three, Michigan, and number four, TCU, needing last-second field goals against unranked opponents to remain unbeaten. Two very dramatic endings in those games. Number five, Tennessee was boat raced 63 to 38 by unranked South Carolina. Number seven, USC narrowly escaped the Rose Bowl with a 48 to 45 win over UCLA. You even had number one, Georgia, looking not very impressive at all in a 16 to 6 win on the road against unranked Kentucky. So by comparison, I think Ohio State's 13 point road win over Maryland doesn't look so bad. Now, The Buckeyes were far from perfect yesterday. They had a season-high 11 penalties for 97 yards. The defense missed 12 tackles. So Ohio State had to overcome a lot of sloppiness on both sides of the ball to secure that win over Maryland to go to 11-0 and set up that big showdown against Michigan next Saturday. So much to talk about from this game. I'm going to assume you watched and you know what happened. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time summarizing everything that happened in this game. So let's get right to my observations. I want to start with the Ohio State running game, of course, and the play of freshman running back Dallin Hayden. Hayden is a player we've been calling for these last couple of weeks. We've wanted to see what he can give the run game. And he showed up big yesterday for the Buckeyes. He quite frankly saved the day for the Ohio State offense in the second half. Hayden ran for 146 yards on 27 carries and three touchdowns. Now 143 of that yardage total and all three of Hayden's touchdowns came in the second half. Now give Travion Henderson a little bit of credit. He tried to give it a go in this game. He started. It was the first time we saw him on the field since the Penn State game. And things looked promising early. Henderson would score on a 31-yard catch and run on a nifty screen play on Ohio State's opening possession to give the Buckeyes an early 7-zip lead. By the way, where the hell is that screen play to Henderson been all season long? I've been screaming into the wind about that. Unfortunately, though, Henderson appeared to re-aggravate his foot injury on that play. He was seen grimacing on the sidelines. He was getting attended to by the medical staff. Now, Henderson would would return to the game, but was clearly limited by that injury and was not able to give Ohio State anything in the running game. He ran for 19 yards on 11 carries in the first half. I mean, it seemed plainly obvious to everyone, including me, but maybe except Ryan Day and Tony Alford, that Henderson would not be able to help them in the run game yesterday. But for some reason, they waited until the third quarter to replace him with Hayden, who then immediately ignited the running game for the Buckeyes with 67 rushing yards and two touchdowns in the third quarter. Hayden had a huge hand and a 17-zip third quarter run that would give the Buckeyes a 27-13 lead going into the fourth quarter. And the game really appeared to be well in hand at that stage for the Buckeyes. I don't know how Hayden isn't your starting running back for the Michigan game. I mean, right? Now, Ryan Day said in the post game that Mayan Williams is on track to play next week. But look, if Williams is a shell of himself, as Henderson was yesterday, Day and Alford cannot afford to waste carries on him. There's just too much at stake, obviously, against Michigan. And I thought looking back on yesterday, Day and Alford were entirely too slow to turn to turn to Hayden yesterday. I mean, I really think we'd be talking about a different result had Hayden started and the Buckeye rushing attack would have gotten off to an earlier start in this game. I, I don't think there's any reason for us to be sweating bullets in the fourth quarter as we were yesterday. But after the opening scoring drive, Ohio State's inability to run the ball just really crippled the offense. The offense would go three and out on its next two possessions after that. They would have a promising drive stall at the Maryland 15-yard line and have to settle for a field goal. Their last drive before halftime stalled at their own 45-yard line and the Buckeyes would head into the locker room trailing 13-10 to 10 with only 159 yards total offense on 31 plays. That's only 5.1 yards per play. That's more than two yards below Ohio State's season average, which actually leads the country. But after halftime, 
The Ohio State offense was much better, thanks in large part to Hayden. 242 yards of total offense and 26 points for the Buckeyes after halftime. Now, we can't really have a discussion about the running game without also talking about the offensive line. The two go hand in hand, and both the Ohio State running backs and the offensive line have taken a lot of criticism over the last few weeks. But on the day, I thought the Ohio State offensive line was very good yesterday. The Buckeyes' overall grades for run blocking and pass blocking were actually quite good, according to PFF. They finished with an overall run blocking grade of 74.8 and an overall pass blocking grade of 90.7, which was their highest grade of the season in that area. So I thought the offensive line did a good job of protecting C.J. Stroud. Stroud was sacked only once. Dewan Jones and Paris Johnson Jr. only allowed one pressure on C.J. Stroud. Jones finished with a pass blocking grade of 84.2 and a run blocking grade of 88 according to PFF. So whatever caused Jones to miss the Indiana game clearly wasn't bothering him yesterday. He was really, really good. It was good to see him out there healthy. Now, there was an unfortunate development on the injury front. Right guard Matthew Jones went down in the fourth quarter. Now, we know he'd been nursing a foot injury of some kind for quite some time. His status for the Michigan game is now up in the air. Man, that is the last thing the Ohio State offense needs is another injury. Their depth has been tested this season like no other that I can remember. I mean, it's it's absurd. I thought it was a B-minus performance from C.J. Stroud and the Ohio State receivers. Stroud finished 18 of 30 for 241 yards and one touchdown. You know, but that touchdown pass was on a screenplay to, to Trey Henderson. Henderson did all the work on that play. Pretty you know, relatively pedestrian numbers by Stroud's standards. Emeka Buka, who is also rumored to be dealing with an injury of some kind, led the Buckeyes with six receptions on 11 targets for 82 yards and no touchdowns. Marvin Harrison Jr. finished with five catches on 10 targets for 68 yards and no touchdowns. Now, Ekbuka and Harrison were both impactful in this game. They both made plays. Harrison Jr. had that gorgeous 29-yard catch along the sideline on Ohio State's first scoring drive. Ekbuka caught a 35-yarder from Stroud in the third quarter to get the Buckeyes into the Maryland red zone on that drive. I actually thought that was that was Stroud's best throw of the game. Ekbuka also had a huge catch on third and six on Ohio State's last scoring drive of the game to keep the chains moving on that one. But Ibuka and Harrison were far from their their usual explosive selves. And then there's Julian Fleming, who just seemed to be MIA for the third week in a row. Fleming finished with two catches on two targets for 30 yards, no touchdowns. Earlier this season, Fleming had a streak of five straight games with at least one touchdown catch. That seems like eons ago. His last touchdown catch was the 79-yarder against Iowa. That was a month ago. Now, I took umbrage with uh, something Joel Klatt said about the Ohio State receivers on the Colin Cowherd show last week. He said the Buckeyes had been leaning too heavily on Marvin Harrison Jr. over these last couple of games and that their other receivers had, quote, fallen off the face of the planet. I don't believe that's a fair characterization of Ibuka's play. While he hasn't been racking up the big stats lately, Ibuka has still been impactful. But for example, last week against Indiana, he had only two catches, but one went for a touchdown and the other was a 32-yard reception that set up another touchdown. And I've always said of Ibuka that he's very economical with his touches. He doesn't need a lot of them to be impactful. And maybe that was a little lost on Klatt. I think Ibuka is the best receiver in the country at doing more with less. But I do think Klatt was absolutely right about Fleming. He has pretty much, quote, fallen off the face of the earth. He had several drops against Northwestern, we remember. And we understand there was weather in that game, but they, those were those were passes that hit him in the hands. He couldn't bring in. He dropped a touchdown catch last week against Indiana, hit him right in the chest. And then yesterday he had two catches in the second quarter, and then we never heard from him again. The Buckeyes are going to need a third receiving threat after Harrison Jr. and Ibuka. There's no question about that. I don't know, maybe Xavier Johnson can give the Ohio State passing game a little something more. Maybe he needs more touches. But personally, I really think it's got to be Julian Fleming finding his way. The Buckeyes are going to need him to be impactful, not only against Michigan, but beyond that. So I really hope Fleming can, can, like I said, can find his way here before the Michigan game. It was a mixed bag, I guess, for the Ohio State defense yesterday, but I still felt like they actually played pretty well. Talia Tungavailoa, who had thrown for under 80 yards in each of his last two games, appeared miraculously healed from his knee injury and was very sharp. 
from the beginning, and Tonga Vailoa was 16 of 18 for 180 yards in the first half. He finished the day 26 of 36 for 293 yards and two touchdown passes. He also ran for another score. I was not expecting to see that version of Tonga Vailoa. I mean, he looked like his older brother for much of the afternoon. And, and we know he has that in him. We've we've known all along he, he is capable of games like that. And man, he single-handedly kept Maryland in that game, both with his arm and his legs. Now, maybe this is just the Ohio State homer in me talking, but I'm much more inclined to just tip my cap to Tonga Bailoa than have any major concerns about the Buckeye defense. Because I thought the Buckeye defense, despite the two fourth quarter scoring drives they gave up to Tonga Bailoa, was still very good, very impactful in this game. Now, they gave up more plays against the Maryland passing game than I would have liked, to be sure. But they did hold Maryland to 84 yards rushing on 31 attempts. That's 2.7 yards per carry. They held Roman Hemby to 39 yards on 11 carries. I think Hemby's a good back. He came into this game averaging six yards a carry. I think he had over 800 yards rushing on the season. So credit to the Buckeye defense for really kind of snuffing out the Maryland running game in yesterday. The Buckeyes also held the Terps to 6 of 14 on third down. I thought the defensive front did a really good job of bringing pressure on Tonga Vailoa. Five sacks, including the game-ending strip sack by Zach Harrison that was returned for a touchdown by Steel Chambers. And I, I just, quite frankly, I wasn't all that bothered by Tonga Vailoa's first half passing yardage. I mean, Maryland only had 13 points on the board at halftime. The Buckeye defense was very good in the red zone, forcing Maryland to settle for field goals on two of their three red zone trips. And I thought most importantly, with the game on the line at winning time, late in the fourth quarter, and the Buckeyes clinging to a one-score lead, Maryland had two opportunities, two possessions, to potentially take the lead. On those two possessions, they ran a total of five plays for negative 11 yards and a turnover, which was the strip sack by Zach Harrison. Tommy Eichenberg, Lathan Ransom, Zach Harrison, JT Tuimolau, Steel Chambers, Ronnie Hickman. I mean, there was so much playmaking on that defense. And as a fan, and by the way, this is a very stark contrast from last season. I've just come to expect that someone's going to make a play. And there's good reason to expect it because over 11 games, we've seen it from a number of different players at every level of this defense. Ohio State has got a lot of playmakers on this defense. And they showed up big at critical moments yesterday. So I, I think the defense actually played pretty well. And tip your cap to Talia Tonga Vailoa. He made plays. He made some plays in the face of great pressure, too, that not a lot of quarterbacks can make. So credit to Tonga Vailoa. I thought the high State defense played pretty well yesterday. Now, aside from that weird blocked extra point that Maryland returned for two points, I thought the Ohio State special teams was also very good and delivered some huge plays when the Buckeyes absolutely needed them. Let's start with Lathan Ransom's third quarter punt block. It was his second punt block in as many weeks. By the way, Ransom broke his hand in the first quarter. He got it wrapped up, returned to the game, and it was with that broken hand that he blocked that punt. And that play completely flipped the momentum of the game back to Ohio State. And uh, by the way, guess who scooped that ball up uh, after the punt block? Yes, it was Xavier Johnson, my guy. Johnson returned the ball to the Maryland 14-yard line. The Buckeyes would score two plays later to take a 17-13 to lead that they would not relinquish. Now, Xavier Johnson would deliver again on special teams for the Buckeyes, this time in the return game. This was in the fourth quarter after Maryland scored to cut the Ohio State lead to 27-21. Johnson would return the ensuing kickoff 46 yards to set the Buckeyes up at midfield. Ohio State would score four plays later to push the lead back out to 33-23. to So a huge return uh, by Johnson in that situation when Ohio State absolutely had to have it. Finally, Ohio State got three big field goals from Noah Ruggles, including one from 45 yards out with 42 seconds to play to basically ice the game. And funny enough, on the ensuing kickoff, the Ohio State coverage team would come up big. They would drop Maryland return man Jacob Copeland inside the Maryland 20, and the Terps would have to start that last possession from their own 16-yard line. And that set the stage for Zach Harrison's back-to-back -back sacks to end the game. I thought the defense and special teams were pretty big for the Buckeyes yesterday. On a day when the offense, the passing game in particular, just didn't have its best stuff. Ohio State is really showing itself to be a complete team that can deliver big plays in all three phases. With all the focus on Stroud, Harrison Jr., and the Ohio State offense, I think that's a, a bit lost on a lot of people. 
So now we can finally turn all of our attention to Michigan. The Wolverines needed a minor miracle to salvage a last second win over Illinois in the big house yesterday. Illinois, man, they had Michigan on the ropes and they just could not finish the job. Of course, the big news coming out of that game was the knee injury suffered by star running back Blake Corum. Late in the second quarter, Corum took a shot to his left knee at the end of a four-yard run at the Illinois 17-yard line. He actually fumbled the ball on the play, reaching for his knee. Illinois would recover the ball to end that scoring threat. Corum would leave the field under his own power, but with a a pretty severe limp. Now, he tried to return at the beginning of the third quarter. I think he had one carry, and the Michigan finally shut him down for the rest of the game. Corum would leave the game with 147 total yards on 20 touches and a touchdown, and his absence in the second half totally crippled the Michigan offense the rest of the way. Michigan averaged 2.7 yards per carry after Corum left the game, and they couldn't do much of anything in the passing game either. J.J. McCarthy was 18 of 34 for 208 yards passing. He was off target in key situations all day long. He was also victimized by some untimely drops by his receivers. There was one by Andrell Anthony in the end zone that really stood out to me. Now, some Michigan fans are going to try to tell you that J.J. McCarthy made plays when it really mattered to help them win this game. But the biggest play he made on that go-ahead scoring drive was an eight-yard completion on fourth and three with 53 seconds to play on what looked like an obvious pick that was not called by the officials. Brett Bielema nearly had an aneurysm on the sidelines. And then on the next play, Illinois is flagged for pass interference, setting up Michigan at the Illinois 22-yard line and eventually that 35-yard game-winning field goal from Jake Moody. I mean, Brett Bielema was apoplectic after the game and for good reason, I thought. So I've been saying it all season with respect to Michigan, what happens when Blake Corum doesn't run for 200 yards? What are they offensively without Corum there to save them? He's been covering up a lot of warts for this offense all season. Now, to be fair, yesterday, Michigan was also without their second leading rusher, Donovan Edwards, who's also a pretty good receiver for them out of the backfield, and tight end Luke Schoonmaker, who is their second leading receiver. If Edwards and Schoonmaker return next Saturday, that, that will give Ohio State a little bit more to think about defensively, but I don't know how much. So Michigan is now 99th nationally in passing offense, and now they might be without the services of their only real reliable playmaker on offense next Saturday. Jim Knowles, I would certainly hope you can devise a defense to deal with that. Okay, that's going to do it for me. A lot more to come on this matchup with the team up north. Look for a preview of that game from Paige, Chad, and myself, perhaps on Tuesday or Wednesday. Until then, thanks so much for listening, and go Bucks. been listening to the south stands a buckeye football podcast you can follow us on twitter instagram and facebook and visit our website at southstandsosu.com